For 15 seasons and 242 games, Nathan Friend exhibited all the traits that make rugby league the greatest game of all. On more than a game, we were privileged enough to chat with Nathan about his magnificent career. All right, Nathan Friend, welcome to More Than A Game. Danny B, thanks for having me, mate. Mate, it's my pleasure. So, um, thanks so much for sharing your amazing story, all the way from Toowoomba West Junior as a five-year-old, all the way to the highest level of rugby league in the NRL. All right, mate, let's get into it. All right, we're gonna actually start with what's been described as the try of the decade. So, let's roll the video, and mate, share with us what's going on here, friendy. You're going straight to the top of my highlight trail. <laughs> You bet, mate. Well, here I was. I was too buggy to get the dummy half. <laughs> uh, so I'm stuck in the middle of the field. Yeah. And I thought, I'm six foot. I might as well get up and catch it. And <laughs> the ball just stuck. Mate. And it's stuck in Johnson's hand. Yeah. Yeah. The Pommy's hand. Yeah, that's right. Sammy uh, Tompkins. Good old Tompkins, yeah. Look at this. In. I've never seen a try like that in all this time. So, mate. That's interesting. You know, I listen to Vossi's voice and... Yeah. You know, you, you play school footy and come yeah. from Toowoomba and we played one game at Suncorp. Yeah. And uh, he was the first man to call the Nutri-Gain Cup. Oh, was he? Yeah. And okay. I, I played, only played one that was obviously uh, filmed back in the day. And yeah. Everyone that played school league wanted to That's play right. in the Nutri-Gain Cup at the time. I remember and, those. Yeah. And he, yeah. he called my first game and then, you know, he yeah. obviously called a few of my other games, but yeah. you know, to hear his voice and I yeah. actually sent him the actual playing jersey of that. He, oh, fair he messaged me and asked if he could oh. have it, and yeah, he's got it all framed in his house. So, That's brilliant. Yeah, it's an honour to obviously yeah. pass it on to him, because he's another, wouldn't say footy tragic, but he's, uh, <laughs> you know, he's, yeah. he's another Ray Warren. Yeah, absolutely, mate. No, he's a legend, Vossi, and yeah, his call, um, I mean, you know, you could have watched that in silent, silent movie mode, you know, and it would have been absolutely sensational, but his voice, um, mate, he really captured the emotion and just how spectacular that try was. So. It's a funny story about... <laughs> but yeah. that, obviously, you know my boys. You, you yeah. taught my my youngest. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, mate. Yeah. F f you know, I don't know why, but uh, football games. The wife would always take him, and he'd want to go to the talk three or four <laughs> times during right. a game of football. And okay, um, just so happens to be that uh, you know before that play, yeah, mum, we're gonna go to the toilet. She's going right, eh? No way. Started to walk down the stairs and heard the crowd go up. <laughs> By the time she got back, my father-in-law was actually over in New Zealand at the time and he showed her the YouTube clip going, it's up already, this is what you missed. <laughs> she was shattered, she didn't even get to see it in, in oh, real life. No. So, oh, no. Oh, Good anyway. old Ollie. Yeah, <laughs> timing. Timing's impeccable. Yeah. Oh, mate, unbelievable. Nah, that, that's the kind of try that will be shown, you know, 100 years from now and people will be like... <sighs> yeah, I'll have it on how hard drive. Did he, he, yeah. <laughs> how did he pull that off? That's sensational. All right, mate, so you were born and raised in Toowoomba, a real rugby league town. Uh, what got you involved in the sport initially? Um, I guess my father, a uh, passionate rugby league man. Uh, he was a jackaroo as a kid, 16-year-old, and he was out oh, west, um, yeah. kind of left home early, didn't do too much schooling. Yeah. Um, but he ventured back into Toowoomba um, in his late teens, yeah. and uh, he took up footy late, like 19 20. Okay. But he uh, he broke his leg when he was 22, mm. um, and obviously he'd married my mum and that since then. And you know, mum said that uh, if you know if you go back to playing footy because mm. he got gangrene and it oh, went pretty bad. Oh and no. She said, you know, if you you, yeah. <laughs> if you take up footy, then I'm out of here. And yeah. so he, he didn't. And <laughs> he always had the passion for rugby league, so he always yeah. coached and everything like that. And right. I've got two sisters, and I was the only boy, and yeah. I guess I went with him everywhere. Yeah. Um, because he was like my brother. Yeah. And best mates. And, you know, yeah. I used to go to his training sessions with, you know, whether it was coach under 18s, A grade or whatever. And I used to yeah. just run around the field kicking the footy. Yeah. And, you know, I was always around it. Yeah. So I guess that was my environment. And, yes. um, you know, as you said, I, I started when I was five and played two years of under sixes, you know, in Toowoomba, yeah. no shoes, just, you know, <laughs> snow on the ground. Play. Yeah. A bit yeah. of frost. And, yeah. yeah, just loved it. So yeah. I guess it's in my, in my blood. And mate, that's sensational. Yeah. 
And so you were playing for West Juniors. You stayed with the club yeah. until under 15 level. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So played till under 14s, got hammered, uh, 50 nil each game. And then under 15s, for we got a couple of new, uh, new players yeah. From, yeah. from other teams. And yeah. we turned it around and we, yeah. we actually won the grand final oh, in, wow. in under 15. So okay. major turnaround. But yeah. uh, that was a, a good yeah. note to finish juniors on. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, I believe then as a young as a young man, like as a 17 year old, you actually got thrown into thrown into, so to speak, with the Wolves in um, senior A grade rugby league. So you young fella towards your late teens playing in A grade um, with men. How do you think that kind of molded you as a footballer and, you know, your mental toughness that was such a signature of your playing style throughout your career? Yeah, I think it's a major part. Yeah. Uh, mentally. Mm. Um, you know, I was 17, I wasn't the smartest yeah. kid at school, so uh, my mum being a hairdresser, she used to do a guy's hair that was a bricklayer, and he said, look, if you get okay. a TAFE, I'll take you on board, and I thought, that's right. my out for, for <laughs> you know, from school, so <laughs> yeah. that I'll, I'll head that way, so yeah. that obviously ingrained, you know, hard work, mm. um, which mm. obviously transfers over to, to rugby league, so, I, yeah. you know, I used to, you know, go lay, well, initially I was... I was just the mud boy, you know. I was doing my apprenticeship, mm. but I was, you know, I was labouring for five guys on the line, and you know, yeah. I'd come home from uh, from work, and I'd just fall asleep, and say, "Mum, wake me up for dinner." Um, yeah. So initially, it was a big shock from the body going to TAFE and going into apprenticeship straight from right. school. Yeah. Um, but that mentally, um, you know, toughened me right up, and then obviously mm. physically, mm. Um, lugging the barrels around and lifting the bricks and stuff, kind of yeah. developed. Um, yeah. As you say, I was only in my teens. Yeah. Um, so that certainly helped uh, yeah. towards rugby league. Yeah. And you know, leaving 17s, and I couldn't play A grade where I was in yeah. my okay in my, in my senior club. So I moved right. moved out of town about well, I stayed in Toowoomba, but uh, yeah. moved down to Gatton, and I played yeah. A grade there. And yeah, I uh, was yep, fortunate right. enough to get um, you know dummy half of the of the year. And um, sensational. Yeah, yeah. The next season, Ivan Henjak, who was in charge of the Clydesdales or Broncos reserve grade. Right. Uh, see me play and um, yeah. sat down with me and said we'd love to you know take you on board obviously yeah. not as a hooker because they had a couple of hookers but he said yeah. Yeah, I'd love to get you in the squad and see how you go so mm. yeah, yeah. kind of progressed from there so that's actually how you ended up with the Brisbane Broncos because at the time like I'm thinking late 90s early 2000s they were probably the most prestigious rugby league club in the world at the time they were coming off like you know um, four premierships in the 90s and so, so Ivan spotted you playing A grade for Gatton as a young fella, and that's how you ended up for the Broncos. Who, essentially, they were the Broncos reserve grade team, weren't they, that you were playing for then the Toowoomba Clydesdales? Correct. So yeah. <clears throat> obviously, I'd, I'd only been two years into my apprenticeship, so yeah. I had another couple of years to run because obviously I wanted my qualifications because yeah. you, know, you didn't know how, how far you know football yeah. was going to go you know the average sure. person is a couple of years or you know some might get out 50 games if they're lucky and, mm. um mm. so i wanted right. to finish that and in doing so and to play for the qualities which were the tourma clothes i was but they were based in brisbane right. uh, i was required to you know finish my work at uh, 2 30 and drive yeah. to brisbane from tourma which is an hour and a half yeah train there with the full squad and then yeah. and get home and and repeat that you know four or five times a week and yeah um you know they're the kind of efforts that you know, you look back and appreciate now, mm. and I certainly appreciate that, and it made my role as a rugby league player mm. a lot easier because I'd rock up to train, and right. you know, at the back end of my career, I'd see young guys, yeah. and they get to train, and they'd be shitting themselves, thinking, <laughs> "Oh, yeah. we've got some exercise to do today." You know, yeah. what have we got? You know, we're trying to find out what's what's in front of them when, yeah, you know, you come from our path where it's yes. like you just knuckle in, you just yeah. you just do it, you know, because mm. you know that. At the end of the day, it's going to improve you and get you where you want to go. So it's just totally different mindset. That is like just just hearing that, friendy. Um, it really, yeah, it's really polar opposites, isn't it? Into how young young players are recruited and initiated into you know top level rugby league these days. I mean, um, yeah, and you were saying you appreciate it. I mean, do you think that young players today, now entering the twenty twenty season, do you think it would be useful for them to do things like you know have an apprenticeship that's required of them, do some type of work, at least have some type of, you know, either job, interest or study outside of um, what they're doing, you know, just tra play training, playing full time. Do you think yeah. that would be of a benefit to players well, these days? Well, I know the uh, the welfare of the NRL are mm. trying to, you know, make sure that, you know, they provide enough money for them to do their education through their rugby league. 
Okay. But as you say, yeah. it's not like doing an apprenticeship and you're working during the day and then training in the afternoon. Mm. Um, right. and, I, and I think they miss that, the young yeah. guys. And that's where Craig Bellamy, he, he goes to the extent where anyone new to the club, whether mm. they be 25 or whether they're mm. 18, yeah. they do two weeks of labour. I'd heard that. And, yeah. and, and that just yeah. know, gives them the appreciation for... Yeah. You know, a rugby league player and, yeah. and his duties. Because, yeah. yeah, we train hard. We train really hard. Um, like any sport, if you want to you know, reach the pinnacles, you need to train hard. Mm. Um, but <clears throat> we have a lot of downtime as well. Where, yeah. you know, we're not on the tools. We're not, you know, banging it out for eight hours, nine hours a day. Yeah. Or like someone else is in an office for, yeah. you know, ten hours a day. Yeah. Now we have those luxuries. Right. Where, you know, these days, yeah. the kids move from school. Yeah. Um, I think they're minimal wage now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks to, you know, the pioneers, the guys, when I was coming through, you know, the Matty guys yeah, and stuff like that, exactly. that really pushed for the Players Association. Yeah. You know, we have to give so much percent of our wage right. to the Players Association to try bring it together. And now, you know, yeah. we've got it strong enough there, the collective bargaining agreement, and, yeah. you know, we get a, a, a fair slice of the pie now as in, yes. you know, TV rights and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the minimum yeah. wage now is like a... 110,000 yeah. or something. So yeah. someone's coming out of school. Yeah. No appreciation for money. No. You know, and, yeah. and, you know, they may be skilled mm. and that's why they're in a position they're in. Mm. But, um, you know, a lot of them don't get there from hard work and understanding. Mm. Right. Which is, you know, which is a downfall sometimes. Yeah. No, that's, um, yeah, and you're the perfect man to provide that perspective. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, in that era, so we're in the year 2000, so you joined the Brisbane Broncos feeder club, the Toowoomba Clydesdales, and you guys actually made the grand final that year in the Interest Super Cup, which was the premier rugby league comp in Queensland. Um, you came up against an experienced Redcliffe team, but unfortunately you guys went down. Um, you actually had Michael Ryan at starting hooker and Kerrod mm -hmm. Walters on the bench as well. Were those years and seasons, were they ones that you were able to learn off the senior Broncos players and work on your game? How do you look back on that kind of era, those few years at the Broncos and with the Clydesdales? Um, I guess I come through an era where, you know, I had Brent Tate, Justin yeah. Hodges, Corey Parker, yeah. you know, all those guys that, um, you know, obviously went on. So, yeah. you know, they were talented guys around me as well. And they were playing for the Clydesdales, That's right, right, your team. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you know, they were obviously contracted to the Broncos, but they were playing the reserve grade, which yeah. is opposite to my, myself, but they were around the environment. Yes. And uh, Ivan Henjak was a great coach. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, look, yeah. learned a lot of early lessons uh, mm. through those guys, but... You yeah. know, it was just good to be around. I didn't, I wasn't kicking stones because I wasn't, you know, the number yeah. nine or anything like that. I was just happy yeah. to be, you know, one step closer to obviously the ultimate and that was playing yeah. first grade. And yeah. I didn't know what was to come, but I was always pretty positive in life. You yeah. know, thanks to my mum. She was, yeah. you know, she was always the one that said, you can do it, you know, you can do it. But the old wow. man gave me tough love and he said, you know, <laughs> you, you're stuffed up here or, yeah. you know, you didn't never, you know, yeah. you never glo glo glossed over the things you did wrong, <laughs> right, yeah. which is awesome because, yeah. you know, if you, if you want to improve, you need to know yeah. you know, where, where you improve. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, so I, I had the best of both worlds, could you say? Yeah. And I was always yeah. glass half full and, and that's kind of kept the fire in my belly and, mm. and made me want to achieve. Yeah. Oh, sensational, mate. Well, it worked out well mm. for you because... Mm. Out of all those blokes, and you listed, you know, people who, you know, played internationals and origins. I'm thinking, yeah, your career <laughs> lasted, yeah, outlasted nearly all of them, if not all of them. So, yeah, um, it just goes to, you know, it's a testament to your persistence and your, and your work ethic. Yeah, absolutely, mate. All right, so it's the year 2002, and the Broncos are in the midst of a state of origin campaign where they had nine players out um, with the origin team and six more regular first graders out injured. Now, this is actually your NRL debut, and you blokes had six debutantes, but you still prevailed 28-14 to 14 under captain Shane Walker in what's now known as the Baby Broncos team. And you guys went down to Leichhardt Oval, played against the West Tigers, and won that match. Now, I believe that Craig Bellamy was actually coach of that game. Is that right? Because I think Wayne, was coach, Wayne Bennett was coaching the Origin team. What do you recall about the lead-up to that match? Because I'm sure, you know, first NRL match and... You know, for a lot of you blokes, that was actually your first NRL match. Mm -hmm. What was the lead-up like, mate, under Craig, well, a young Craig Bellamy? Well, that, that was the first year that I trained full-time with okay. the squad. So, yeah. 
November the year before, yeah, my beautiful yeah. wife and I, we moved to Brisbane from Toowoomba. Okay. Uh, bought a house down Logan Way. And, yeah. But I was training full time, so I was buzzing from, you know, day yeah. dot. Um, <laughs> yeah, running around with the likes of Alfie and you know, Kevin Walters That's and all right. those boys, yeah. um, doing the gap runs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, loving life. Famous nice gap run. <laughs> yeah. Did so Wayne was, win that one that year? No, did you get Wayne? Well, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I got him around Red Hill, actually, because okay. he, he did love Red Hill. Did, um, yeah. All the hills. And, yeah. I mean, I. I didn't know where to go, so I had to keep someone inside. <laughs> I kept Wayne in sight until about yeah. uh, probably a K to go. And right. Kevy Wilders, well, he won, but he was okay. always in front of Wayne. Yeah. And I was like, well, I can I can see Kevy, so if I pass Wayne, <laughs> yeah. at the last minute, I'll be able to catch Kevy. So nice. I beat Wayne, and I think yeah. he'd probably appreciate a yeah. little fella taking two strides. Yeah. He's won. Yeah. And I uh, kept up with him, and then he I overtook him Sally. at the end there. So, yeah. yeah, so, you know, all that season leading up to that game you know obviously mm. origin period middle of the year mm. um the week that was it was mm. craig obviously we know how good of a coach he is and he yeah. kind of you know wayne was head coach but he was the assistant he had been for a mm. few years at the bronx yeah. and he took us all through our conditioning everything like that so yeah. um it was it wasn't a big transition wayne being away yeah so it was kind of okay. business as normal mm. um and he didn't overcomplicate things like he does now he never yeah overcomplicates it yeah. asks for the best of you tells yeah. you what he, he wants from you and yeah um we went out and did it and geez yeah. i tell you mate that that game felt like it went for about 10 minutes i reckon i played 60 oh, minutes man. and yeah. the game just felt just went so quick what, just the pace was like another level? Uh, well, from what you'd yeah. been used to playing? Well, 100%. You yeah. just, you know, the speed of it and just, I don't know whether it was the excitement, everything just happened. Like, I suppose it's like your wedding mm. day, mate, you know, it's 12 <laughs> months lead up to yeah. it. You're like, oh, is it ever going to come? And it comes yeah. and you're like, it's gone. Yeah. You know, so it, it's much like that. That's amazing, mate. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you then moved to the newly formed at that time, Melbourne Storm. Well, and. <laughs> Well, my well, first, my okay, my game, my, actually, uh, my debut. I, I got yeah. suspended from my debut. I spear tackled. Um, <laughs> Who'd you get? In um, Senna. Okay, oh, Darren, Darren Senna. Center. Yeah. And uh, I come down with an elbow at the same time, so I got two weeks. <laughs> and, you were uh, pumped, weren't you? But you then uh, Willie Manu. Yeah, with, with, yeah, with big Red second Star. roller. He's a big hitting second He spear tackled me, so he got, <laughs> got two weeks. Well, Wayne called me into his office yeah. during that week. He said, mate, yeah. it's unfortunate that um, yeah. you, know, you got the week. And, you know, mate, I've got you in the squad next week. Oh, so I was like no. shattered when he said oh, that. No. But, um, yeah. you know, here's what it is. Yeah, because was Luke Prittis, was he the hooker at the time? Yeah. In 2002? Yeah. yeah. For the, yeah. That's right, for the Bronx, yeah. And so Wayne was going to elevate you. Oh, yeah, yeah. mate, no. Obviously, I put Luke out of the finest spot. So I was like, yeah, you know, I was pretty sure. pumped when yeah, I'm sure you know, he's they had Shane Walker you. there and everything. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, mate, that's brutal. Well, um, your first year did coincide with Craig's first year coaching at the Storm. Was Craig a big part of you moving to the Storm? Is that how that Yeah, happened? it was... Uh, yeah. yeah, it's weird how it happened because yeah? one day we were in the car together. we just come back from a training session away from Red Hill and he said, I'll jump in my car and come back. And that's when he had a chat to me. He said, look, oh. I'm, I'm actually being appointed Melbourne coach. Um, love it if, uh, you know, if, if you'd come down with me. So yeah. I was like come back and had a chat to Kel and I was like well yeah. here's an opportunity let's let's yeah. do it because they had uh, Richard Swain in Melbourne yes and um as Craig said that he would probably be no longer yeah um the dummy heart I think he came to the Broncos that yeah I think yeah. I think you could yeah, yeah so he came in and had a couple of years yeah yeah so I was like oh, yeah well it's a big opportunity yeah. um moved from Toowoomba to Brisbane that was a mm. major change and we thought well what's another change so yeah, yeah we yeah. did it um, wow. Moved down to Melbourne, as you yeah. say, um, 2002, the back end, November, and yeah. the wife and I got married in January, yeah. uh, 2003. Beautiful. In uh, back here in Brisbane, so she stayed here, uh, yeah. finished up her work commitments, yeah, um, and then I come back had the wedding in January, yeah. and we both moved back to Melbourne. So Brilliant. That's amazing how, yeah. you know, the fortune. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm very fortunate. You know, obviously, opportunity only presents itself with hard work, but yeah, you know, I was I was very lucky that yeah, you know, time and place. Oh, mate, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, good things come to those who work hard. So yeah, that's that's a great example of that. All right, now the storm preseason training camps are now the stuff of legend. Can you give us an insight into what a preseason training camp would be like with the Melbourne Storm when you were a part of the team, mate? Yeah, so preseason, uh, first year of Craig's. Uh, tender down yeah. there of 
How many has he been there now? Yeah, 17, well, 2000, yeah 17 years yeah, would be now. There you go. Incredible. So, uh, but being his first, yeah. um, first, first time head coach yeah. in charge, I guess he didn't know the boundaries, how he could push the players. Oh, no. Um, so, Sounds dangerous. Yeah, did a really big off-season. Yeah. Um, as I said earlier, he was the conditioning coach of the Broncos, so yeah. he understood a lot of that. Um, mm. But he, he brought Alex Corvo with him yes. um, to Melbourne. Yeah. And um, we did a fair few miles in our legs uh, mm. the whole off-season. So mm. a lot of boys with shin splints and all that kind wow. of stuff. So we do... A lot of endurance. We do Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Um, they were 10K runs. Sheesh. But we'd, they could be 5 2Kers, you know, 10 1Kers. But we'd all always break it down to the 10Ks. And then and the other days, um, the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday mornings, um, they were all ball-based, but we'd make sure we do the 10 to 15K... Uh, as well, so we're we we're getting the ball skills, but we we're getting a lot of uh, yeah. mileage under the legs. Um, so uh, that made us mentally tough. Um, and then yeah. at the end of the off season, just before Christmas, we went on a camp. So yeah, this is the first camp, but we went with SOG guys, yeah. special operations guys. Um, <laughs> we didn't know what to expect. He Fair said, thing. just uh, rock yeah. up with minimal clothing. Mm. Um, got <laughs> there. <laughs> we all got a. There was four teams, four different colours. Yeah. Uh, there was probably eight a team. Yeah. And others uh, had like yellow one, two, three, four. We couldn't call the individual by their name. Right. Um, and we got blindfolded. Yeah. And or even before we got on the on the bus, um, we yeah, spent can... probably a half an hour in the, in, in the parking lot doing push ups, sit ups. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, just getting absolutely hammered. And, wow! Before and then you got on the bus, blindfolded, hopped in the bus. And they had thing, uh, something down south of Melbourne called the Thousand Steps. So yeah. um, before we got to the Thousand Steps, we actually went to St Kilda Beach, yeah. Um, yeah. did sessions just in our teams, like yeah. all against each other with ropes, holding them above the water, weren't allowed to touch the water, fully clothed, yeah. rolling along the sand, into the water, <laughs> just getting absolutely tormented. Um, yeah. yeah, blindfolded, down to the steps, blindfolded, and next time we opened out, you know, took the blindfold off, we are in the middle of the bush, we could have been anywhere. Unbelievable. And we spent three nights there, uh. I think on average, we, we probably got about five or six hours sleep over those three nights, and um, yeah, it was next level, I mean, they took scales yeah. there, and yeah. you know, I think on average, some, we all lost like four kilos, <laughs> yeah, on average, but um, she. You know, some of the things we did, you know, we used to have pet rocks. We had to have pet yeah. rocks in our hands. So every time they call <laughs> us to stand, we'd all have to hop in our, you know, rocks. in our lines and we'd put the rocks out. If you didn't have your rocks, there was yeah. consequences for everyone. Wow. And we had these bars, which were, you know, just the Rio bars that you use yeah. in concrete, you know. Yeah. It was this long. We had to take them on our walks. We had to have them with the, the whole time. It was like our gun. And we had to have them when we were standing guard. And, you know, we had a, a piece of tarp. And that yeah. was our, that was our... Yeah, our shelter for the night. Oh, we that's what you slept under. Yeah, so <laughs> two people had to stay guard, and yeah. you know we got to sleep for about an hour, and then yeah. they set the fireworks off, and away we go again. And yeah, so you know it's a it's a, it was an amazing experience, and mm. the mine was under so much fatigue. That yeah, you just remember everything from it. Yes, and there was one night they we had no watches, nothing. So a uh, little later, found out it was like ten thirty at night. Mm. We all just piled into the to the uh, vans, and yeah. they said, look, we'll just drop you off. Next time you see the van, you hop on the van. Yeah. And said, if uh, if you hear someone behind you, you have to say, halt, who goes there? Right. Um, because no one wants to get caught, or there's going to be more penalties, and you had to stand <laughs> up, you couldn't sit down. Yeah. And because, um, you know, these SOG guys, they had um, uh, night vision goggles. Yeah. So they were always going to come out and get someone. <laughs> and so like, yeah. everyone was on edge, and we were just, and so Spines. they put us out in the bush, like mm. along this, driveway they spaced us 100 meters apart mm. all the way like the 30 of us 100 wow. meters apart yeah and you could hear people from the other side of the bush because yeah. it was the dead of night yeah. started to sprinkle rain and it was like <laughs> hold it goes there hold it goes there like, <laughs> and <clears throat> yeah you know not lying but um it was four hours later yeah after just standing there for four hours like that yeah and it started to hallucinate, thinking, here yeah. comes the car around, around, yeah. around the corner. Here comes you the van. Would. Here it is. Lack of sleep and no, dehydration. Not, yeah. Yeah. It's like, ah. no. Nah. 
Yeah, yeah it's amazing. The mind started to play tricks. And then, right. yeah, we rolled in there and we finished up the camp, which is you know, a massive achievement. But you look at the guys that were there and mm. what they've done from there. I think that's, yeah. as you talk about the, you know, the building blocks of yeah. an athlete or mentally, mm-hmm. you get that right, then the rest follows, you know. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's such a powerful, you know, the computer is so powerful. And if you, yeah. you know, if you mould that correctly, like Craig did with a lot of those boys, that's, yeah, that's the Greg Inglis, that's the Billy Slater, yeah. the Kev Smith, we all, yes. Cooper Cronks, everyone ventured there yes. at that time. But then we yes. had the senior players like Steve Kearney and right. that guy and Robbie Kearns and Robbie Ross and all those yeah. guys there, you know, that paved the way for us and showed mm. us mm. showed us how to, yeah, mm. how to train and mm. what to do. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I bet those senior blokes got a bit of a <clears throat> shock too because they'd probably been doing <clears throat> vastly different camps under the previous coaches, um, I'm assuming, but... Did, did, any, did any of them share with you, like, gee, this is a lot different than what we used to when, when Bellyache first came in? No, well, it was certainly different because they were yeah. like, shit. But <laughs> none yeah. of them spat the dummy, you know, they just took it, yeah. took it on board. Like, yeah. we had Dave Kidwell, we had yep. Brett White, we had, yeah. you know, Ryan Hoffman. There's so right. many guys there. Yeah. It was just a really good nucleus of guys that, yeah. you know, I guess the reason why they were in Melbourne, yes. you know, they were just toilers. Yeah, and that's yeah. why they got there Strong in the first ethic, place, yeah. you know, because mm-hmm. um, they come from Western Reds and right. all these Super League days, yeah. and they've all come there. Yeah. Um, you know, Denny Williams yeah. as well, yeah. you know, yeah. just yeah. like off-the-cuff sort of players, but, mm. Um, mm. yeah, on the edge, and then they yeah. just come in there and, yeah. you know, made a name for themselves down in Melbourne. And, yeah, um, absolutely. You know, like these guys just took it in the stride because that's their personality, and they were just like, well, yeah. this is not hard for me, you know, and then you really yeah. looked up to those guys. yeah. Because, yeah. you know, they played in the 99 grand final. That's uh, 90, right. Yeah, yeah, 99 grand final. And I was at that game. I was, was there too. Were you, mate? Yeah, I actually... Wow. Never been to Sydney, but no. uh, yeah. I, I got an opportunity. Tommy Rodonik has actually called <laughs> me up. I think I was 17 or 18 at the Tommy, time. Tommy, calendar, and, uh, really? He said, oh, that's look, great. I know some guy that's at, at the Sharks. You know, yeah. if you want to go down for a weekend. Yeah. They were, you know, had, I don't know, they must have had about 50 kids around 17, 18 years of age and you have your yeah. week of training and then you go and play a couple of games. So, okay. yeah, Dad and I jumped in the car, we drove to Sydney. Yeah. Uh, friends of ours, like Tony Jensen, he was from yep. Toowoomba. He played yep. for Manly a couple of times. Remember Tony Jensen? So, yeah. we, um, so we stayed at his place and we mm-hmm. drove all the way down to Cronulla every day for the yeah. week, which is like yeah. an hour and a half in Sydney traffic down yeah. there in Sydney. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it just so happened to be that it was the grand final week. Yeah, and the dad said, "Well, let's go to the footy." And so, oh, yeah. yeah, went to yeah. our first grand final, and that was, you know, the storm. Yeah, and then, yeah, it's a big comeback, wasn't it? That's Nine kind of, yep. yeah, the first, the drag. One of the first times, yeah, where we saw that incredible culture of them <laughs> just not giving in, having that discipline, just playing full eighty minutes. Yeah. It was amazing that you were there, and then you obviously became such a big part of that culture. Yeah, actually, yeah. last year, and, and you talk about the culture, it's how yeah. they. That's why they're so strong in Eastern cultures because they've had success, but mm. you know, for such a, a young, young, yeah. you know, club. Yeah, that's but right. Our old boys, you know, we all stay on WhatsApp, and, and Pete Robinson, ah, Robbie Kearns have evolved amazing. that old boys club. That that's great. Every year, yeah. you find your own way there to Melbourne. They'll take yeah. care of your accommodation. They they oh, make really? a big weekend of it. Oh, um, wow. And so. Last week, yeah. last year, obviously, was yeah. the 99 yes. reunion. 20, yeah, 20, 20 year, years. And then yeah. the 10 year, the 09. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah, right. You yep, know, yep, it's yep. amazing. And, and they just, yeah. you know, I think they had about 300 odd people wow. um, on a Friday luncheon. That's Just testing, celebrating man. the way they do it, you know, it's just it's so good. It's great to be a part of. I was just so lucky and fortunate that, yeah, been around. Absolutely, mate. No, that's a real testament to the club's culture, mm. as you say. That's brilliant. All right, so now in 2006, the mm. Storm's potentials turning into performance now. They, you guys win the minor premiership with you and Cam Smith forming a two-headed monster of a hooker rotation. <laughs> you guys roll through the favoured Dragons in the preliminary final to reach your first NRL grand final. Now, I remember you coming off the bench in that game, and like when you came on, your defence and your non-stop work rate really flustered their forwards and really wrested the momentum back to you guys, and you just rolled through them towards the end of that second half. What do you remember of that that game, that preliminary final? Because I remember the Dragons were pretty much favoured going into that game because that had a few years where they'd built up a really powerful roster, like what Barrett, Gaznier out in the backs, Luke Bailey, yeah, Rolls. Jason Rolsey. Yeah, yeah. But you guys just came over the top of them in the second half. What are your memories of that game, mate? Yeah, um, <laughs> I've had a few head knocks, but uh, <laughs> I only remember the big games. But yeah. uh, I remember the ones we lost, like 
the grand final the week oh, after. Okay. But, uh, oh, okay. Oh, they're the ones that haunt you. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like I said, you know, yeah. I don't look at the positives too much. I was always like, yeah. where do I go wrong here? Or what, what do I need to improve on? Got your dad on? But, still uh, whispering. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Never be happy, never be happy. But, um, <laughs> yeah, look, um, that was my role, mm. you know. Um, three years leading up to that, I was in mm. and out of first grade. Probably went mm. down to Melbourne and I only played 20-odd games. And then yeah. it was round three in Adelaide. Yeah. Um, we played Penrith and Adelaide and yeah. I got an opportunity to play that game and you know, I was mm. fortunate that Greg Inglis was in my team and yeah. um, we put on a couple of plays and he scored a couple couple uh, length of the field tries and made me look good <sighs> yeah. and Craig said, well, maybe there is a spot for you for the rest of the year and mm. um, kicked on and played 23 or 24 you know, of those games straight and as yeah. you say, uh. played in the major and yeah, yeah made, made yeah. the GF. But yeah. Um, yeah, that was my role, you know, Smitty would... Just go to uh, halfback for twenty odd minutes, mm -hmm. back end of the game. Yeah. Get him out of the middle, and mm -hmm. yeah, he was yeah classy enough that he could do that. You know, he could just play play anywhere if you if you really wanted. He play front row, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah he's smart sure. enough to take care of himself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're in the GF, and <clears throat> now you guys are actually favourites over the Broncos, who lost in the first week of that semi-finals series that year to the Dragons, whom mm -hmm. you guys rolled. Share with us what the grand final week was like leading up to that game. Do you remember? Because people, you know, us mere mortals always see in the media and, you know, see the grand final breakfast and everything. What's it actually like as a player leading up to a grand final? Now, I guess being in Melbourne and it's like no one knew who you were. Yeah. There was no big following of the Melbourne Storm. There was a following, but it was just like a small nucleus of just the blue collar people, mm. uh, which we loved. and. Seen yeah. them after every game, you know, we used to go back to the social club, wherever it may be, and you just sit there yeah. and gather with them for a good hour or two, which yeah. is fantastic. But, yeah. you know, the week of the of the grand final, yeah. we, uh, you know, a training ground, it probably have two people in it, you know, I had, Fair you know, you could have had about 5,000 people, you know, it was just wow. amazing to see that, you know, it was like a game day every, every yeah. time you trained. Yeah. And, but because we were in Melbourne, <clears throat> we had to fly out to the breakfast on Thursday, fly back, you know. So there's all those things that you had to take into yeah. into account. We weren't just a Sydney-based team. Mm. Um, but it was, yeah, it was a great week. Yeah. And as I say, you know, you got to really absorb it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I did, you know, you hear from people that you never hear from. And, um, yeah, I loved it. It yeah. was fantastic, you know. I would oh, never yeah. have, you know, thought I'd make, you know, a GF. Yeah. Um, and, well, obviously when I went to Melbourne and, <clears throat> the culture that we had, you knew it was probably going to happen, but in mm. your time, you weren't quite sure. And mm. I was fortunate that I was a part of it, obviously, on the bench, but I only played about 25 minutes when, yeah, it was, yeah. I come on and it was yeah. we're probably 14 points behind. It was a bit of a uh, yeah. bit of a shame how the game <clears throat> mm. panned out. You know, I, I don't, I haven't really gone back and watched it, but from memory, there was a few dodgy calls that, you know, etching your mind. There's a few spoken about Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, where... There was no third umpire back in those days and, um, you know, if they had the bunker it would have been a different story but you can't look back at that. Yeah. Like, I just look back at that with fond memories and, yeah. you know, I think it's part of my, you know, yeah. footy. Yeah, brilliant. Well, you know, as history showed, the Broncos did get the chocolates in that game, as you said. Do you feel, mm -hmm. though, that, you know, it's often said that teams need to lose one game to go on and win mm -hmm. their own premierships. Do you feel that that 06 loss from the Storm, that, really helped the young Storm go on and win then the 07 and 09 premierships. Do you reckon that really yeah. gave them that experience? 100%. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, they certainly learned from their mistakes, whatever whatever it may be. Mm. Um, and they, obviously, I moved here yeah. um, post 06 and, you know, started at the, the coast of the Titans. And, you know, I sat down on the couch um, that GF day and I, 07, I watched them and they were, you know, they were clinical and, and there was like 40 odd points and yeah. you knew that they had the fire in the belly and mm -hmm. you know they were out to prove something and they you know obviously trained for it all year and it was great to see yeah 100%. yeah absolutely mate all right so you've now established yourself in the nrl the titans sign you as a foundation player however you had a battle with clean amos to win the starting hooking spot for the newly founded titans which by mid-season you'd become the starting hooker and that was your position over the next five years uh, what do you remember about you know, the, that first year of the Titans. I, I remember there's a bit of hysteria, you know, there's a lot of excitement. Myself being someone who was living on the Gold Coast in 07, what do you remember, mate, as a player yeah. in that first year? I think, you know, it's, it's funny how footy works. You know, I was in Melbourne, um, mm -hmm. struggling to crack it. Like, 05, once again, Craig, a big supporter of myself. Um, you're running to Michael Searle. Yeah. This is after the Titans were, 
you know, they said they're coming in in 07, yeah. this was 05. Yeah. Um, so they knew they were putting a team together and he right. said, look, Mick, uh, I think I've got a guy that, you know, would be suitable for, for the coast. And um, we sat down with Mick and we sorted out a, a contract. And mm. um, this was 05. So yes. Craig said to me, he said, mate, if you take the opportunity, he yeah. said, we'll have you in 06. Because I didn't right. have a contract for 06. So I said, well, I haven't got a contract. And he said, look, um, don't worry about that. We'll yeah. take you on board. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can move over there. So yeah. I signed in 05 for 07. Right. Yeah. So I was the number seven signing. Yeah. Um, yeah. For yeah. the coast. Okay. Um, yeah. One so of the got, first ones. I've got the surfboard in the room there. Where yeah. The inaugural guy's got a surfboard with a number on and all oh, that kind of stuff. That? So yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. it's great memorabilia to keep. Um, but yeah. yeah, as you say, much like the Melbourne crew, everyone just come from afar. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some handy players that come yeah. in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, been at past premiership teams. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Older guys, you know, some mid-20s, which was great. Yeah. Um, as you say, you know, Luke Bailey, we played the Dragons. Yeah. Uh, he popped in there, Mark Manicello, Anthony yeah. Frankie, all those sort of older guys. And then we had a lot of young right. guys as well. Right. And uh, Johnny Carwright that come from the Roosters, you know, yeah. as the assistant coach, and they had a lot of success, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Johnny brought in, you know, Billy Johnson, who was... Yeah. Well renowned for yeah for his training techniques and stuff. Oh, Billy was your conditioner. Billy Johnson, correct. So did he bring him from the cow? Did, was he in the cowboys yeah. before then? Yeah, oh. yeah. So he he come down. Gee, that'd and, be interesting. Uh, <laughs> it certainly was. You know, yeah. I, I rocked in from Melbourne and I was, you know, I was eighty nine kilos. Mm. Um, when I come mm. in, I seen our doc. Yeah. And uh, my first meetings with the doc, and yeah. I had a bit of a sore shoulder. And yeah. I had for a few weeks in Melbourne and yeah. this is November I had a few right. weeks off and you know off season as you do you know enjoy yourself and yeah. come into the dock and he was just giving me a medical and I said oh your shoulder's a bit sore and he said it's more than sore he said I think you've got a labrum tear and I'm like oh, oh shit so shit. went and had scans yeah. and, I, and yeah. I had a labrum tear so this was November and um I had to get in get, get an operation ASAP so I spent the whole off season yeah. Uh, under Billy's oh. guidance, you yeah, know, Billy. he was taking care yeah. of the main squad, but then yeah. obviously we were 4.30, I was getting up, hopping on the bike, riding, <laughs> like going, going down to Miami, <laughs> we are up at Runaway Bay, but we'd meet at yeah. Miami, sit yeah. on the bike for a good couple of hours, riding Jeez. down Corumban Rocks and back yeah. up, and yeah, so I spent, you know, I hate swimming, and then I had a sore <laughs> shoulder, and I was swimming, <laughs> you know, two yeah. k's in the pool, lucky I had uh, flippers. But, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. I did everything. And I was like 81 kilos at the end of that off-season. Oh, wow. Um, so Gee. the off-season, you know, in Melbourne was mentally very, very tough. And that obviously just set me up for Bill. Um, mm. It was kind of mm. a breeze, but, it, you know, mm. certainly mm. Um, made us all appreciate what hard work does once again, especially the young guys here at the coast, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and brought us older guys together even more, you know. Being mm. away from family, you obviously mix yeah. together a lot more. Yeah. Uh, spend time away from football with each, with each right. other as well. So that certainly helps. Yeah. Transfers onto the footy field. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I did that. But as you say, the, oh, I remember the first game at, at Suncorp. Yeah. So, yes. you know, I was, I was building George, up to that first game, you know. Yeah, yeah. against St George because, yeah. you know, I, I had it in November or or early December my operation so I really only had a few months and I was like yeah that was my aim and, and yeah. I got back for the first game I was on the bench and we yeah you know, played the first game which was yeah you know, which was fantastic as I say Clint Amos was was the hooker there and yeah it was a it was a sea of red and white because the dragons do have a lot of supporters uh, but there was some yeah. yellow and blue don't worry about that yeah, and, uh, yeah. yellow and gold mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah we you know yeah I think we come back here the, the week after, and yeah. yeah, we just at Carrara. Yeah, that's might right. might have been a mile away. But, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, it was just unbelievable the, the atmosphere yeah. that we had at, yeah. at Carrara. Yeah, well, you got a lot of support really quickly because um, for mm. the first, well, for the first five seasons of the Titans' existence, they were a hot ticket on the Gold Coast, attracting sponsors and crowds. And you guys also enjoyed a lot of success on the field. And in 2010, you guys won your first semi-final, defeating the Warriors at home. I remember I was at that game at Skill Park, and um, there was just a real sense of um, excitement around the place. And so you actually advanced, due to other results, you advanced straight into the preliminary final. Against the Roosters. Against the Roosters. You won game away from the big dance. And I think they scheduled it up at Old Lang Park, didn't they, at Suncorp Stadium? Um, and, you know, it was a great season for you guys. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, the Roosters come away with uh, the chocolates again in, in that game. Do you remember? Because I remember the atmosphere of that game up at Suncorp was unbelievable. 
the fans, the Titans fans, mm. we were just so pumped for all of that, you know. So what, what do you remember about that preliminary final? I know it might not be such great memories <laughs> <laughs> result-wise, but yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was just, uh, just has a combination of a lot, you know, those four years leading up. So we had Billy for the first two years. Yeah. And mentally just got the young guys and the older guys just all on the same page. Yeah. Just work hard for results. And yeah. then we had Chris McClellan come in and yes. he put a bit of size on us and got the strength yeah. up there. And so, uh, yeah, both of those guys together, um, mm. yeah, make it come in after and just added to us. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it certainly helped our performance on the field. You know, 09, as you say, the major in 10. So, yeah. um, leading up to it, we, you know, we had great camaraderie and mm. um, moving into the into the major, yeah, yeah, we were confident because yeah. yeah, no one really gave us too much hope um, all season, and mm. you now we play for each other, and yeah, that's what you need to do to to win the big ones, and yeah. we thought you know yeah. we're a fair chance, but yeah. unfortunately, uh, Roosters were just yeah, they were clinical. They did, uh, from memory, the the error rate was you know I think they completed around the ninety odd percent, and yeah. even this day and age, mate, if you if you don't have the completion, it's it's very hard to contain a team. Yeah. Yeah. Well, nevertheless, um, you know, it was 2010 was a big year for you because, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of people felt that you should have played for Queensland in the State of Origin team that year. And <clears throat> that was the team that was striving for its fifth consecutive series win. So um, with Cam Smith injured, it was down to yourself and Matt Ballin. Um, were you called into camp for that? I, I, I've just, I remember reading media reports at the time that, you know, there was like a decision being made. What, what was... What was that whole process um, involving yourself and get, you know, that decision for the hooking spot in 2010? Yeah, well, obviously I had everything crossed because uh, yeah. Kevin Smith, he doesn't get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, he's yeah. always been in front of me, the, you know, the big guy and uh, hats off to him. But he, yeah, he, he was down for the count. And, yeah. Um, yeah, look, my name was thrown up there with Matty B, but... Yeah. Um, obviously, I wasn't wasn't called in. I don't think they required a, another hooker on the bench, and they just put Matty in there, and he did a great job for Queensland. But yeah, yeah. it would have been, you know, you you watch, you know, an Origin, you just think, how do they do it? You know, it would have just been great to be a part of one. You know, having played a GF, um, yeah. it'd just be next level again. Mm. Well, I mean, the the thing about it is, the reality is, is that if not for a certain C Smith. You could have well have been Queensland hooker for a good, you know, 10 years during that big run, you know, from like 2007 all the way through to, well, 2013, they remain undefeated, you know, if not for Cam. Um, could have been passing to Jay Thurstow on the left. And, yeah, <laughs> Cooper on the right. Yeah, yeah, on the exactly, right. on the yeah, exactly. right. And <clears throat> I know you're not a man of regrets, but no. you sometimes in your own personal moments, do you think, oh, mm. gee, Curse you, damn Cameron <laughs> Smith. <laughs> I no, know you guys are mates, but yeah. yeah no, I, I just look at it and think yeah. how blessed I was to yeah. start at Brisbane under the yeah. guidance of Wayne and, you know, obviously yeah. Ivan, and then Craig to bring me down to Melbourne. And, yeah. you know, his his guidance and then Cam being around me and around such great players, yeah. you know, I learned from the best. Right, um, yeah. He's proven that. And, yeah. you know, he certainly probably, if I didn't have him around, it probably wouldn't have, you know, advanced my game. So, mm. yeah, 100%, mate. It's yeah. I, no regrets whatsoever. Yeah. I, I guess I just thank my lucky stars that I was, yeah, a part of, you know, the, the great club down there. And that's, yeah, know, allowed me to, you know, progress and play 15 years of first grade. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, mate. Now, at one point extending from 2008 to 2010, Friendy, you played 56 consecutive games. In such a physically demanding sport such as rugby league, what do you credit your unbelievable durability to? Like training, recovery, diet? <laughs> What's the secret, yeah, mate? I think it's a bit of bit of everything, mate. You know, we play in a contact sport and yeah. I guess a lot of luck has to play play into it too, you know, and I'm I'm in the middle. But uh mm. you know, I guess a lot of a lot of guys get injured when they have guys get injured when they're carrying the ball and yeah. I obviously didn't carry the ball too many times, you know. I, I tackled those guys with the ball, but, yeah. uh, you know, I didn't, so I wasn't getting yeah. hit from the side or anything like that, so I, I guess, you know, if I've had five shoulder operations, which is probably uh. a testament to how many tackles I've made, but, yeah. you know, I didn't have to lose any knees or ankles, kind of serious yeah. ones that can really knock people around. Mm. Um, so, you know, 50-odd games straight, mm. um, moved to the coast and, yeah. you know, really took on board the nutrition side of things and the recovery and, yeah. you know, you look at a guy called Mark Minicello who's yeah. just retired over mm. in England and mm. he's played, he must play for about 17 or 18 years, right. you know, yeah. many, 
And he's a guy that would, yeah. he would stretch, stretch for a half an hour, 45 minutes after every session, oh, every wow. game, you know, yeah. the ice bars, recovery. And, yeah. You know, there's a, lot, there's a lot to that. Yes. You know, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. You know, sports science has a lot to, to play in rugby yeah. league where sometimes they can get in the road of things. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, mm. other times when it comes to recovery, I think they're good. Yeah. No, brilliant, mate. Well, now in 2012, you sign with the Warriors, and they actually take up a contract extension option for you to play there all the way through to the end of 2015. What are your memories of your time with the Warriors, mate? Yeah, well, it's funny. <laughs> the start is comical, and I guess it just stayed yeah. that way because uh, Ivan Cleary, um, yeah. I went over and seen him in 2011. Went over to Auckland and we just had a look around with the wife and I okay. and just to see if we enjoyed the place because you'd yeah. always fly over there. You'd stay in the city, stay yeah. in a motel. Yeah. It's always rain, <laughs> cold. Yeah. And then you drive through Penrose, which is like mm. industrial area, mm. get to the game, it'd be cold. Yeah. You, know, you go into the sheds, they were ordinary. They were like <laughs> built in 95 of their first game. <laughs> yeah, right. At Mount Smart. That's and it. It's yeah. like, well, do I really mm. want to be here? Mm. And then, mm. yeah, we went over yeah. there and the place was blue skies and... They obviously took us to the nice areas of, of Auckland on the east side <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Um, we just loved it there yeah. and it had a really good feel and yeah. come back and said, Ivan, yeah, look, you know, we'd love to you know, come over for the two years with an option and mm. um, went to come over uh, or go over to New Zealand and uh, Ivan got taken by Gus to, to Penrith, so I didn't even get to get oh, coached under him. Of course, yeah. So, so it was like, <laughs> mate, what, what are you doing to me? Because yeah. they just come off a grand final, you know. They obviously That's lost. That's right, but 2011, yeah. yeah. It's me yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, I missed yeah. that opportunity to be coached by him, and I think he'd, he probably had the guys going, you know, in the right direction, and it would have mm. been fantastic. And that was mm. part of the reasoning for, mm. you know, wanting to go over there and right. you know, taste a bit more success. But, yeah, uh, wasn't to be, uh, and then obviously went through about four different coaches over my yeah you know, four year four or five coaches actually over my yeah. year and uh, yeah just weren't getting the results as as they'd liked so they kind of swapped and changed uh, yeah. coaches. Well, of course, the try of the decade occurred in 2015, and at the end of that year, many people felt that that'd do you for for your career. But the Gold Coast Titans came calling, friendy, and new coach Neil Henry installed you as co-captain with Will Zilman. You produced your consistent excellence as always and often topped the tackle count, which you did more times than not throughout your career. However, it was a tough old year for the Titans. What are your memories, mate, of that final season as captain in 2016? Um, so, I guess it probably wasn't the finish that I was searching for. It would be my last year. Um, obviously, I didn't know it was my last year leading into the season. Um, yeah. But the crew that we had was completely different to when I left in 2011. Yeah. Right. But, um, yeah, mate, we, uh, yeah, we started quite well, you know, we um, had a pretty decent team, a lot of young guys and a few of the older heads that were still around. Yeah. Um, looked pretty good, back end of the season, probably about nine games out, and then that's when uh, they introduced the home plane. And oh, right, You popped right. in and... Um, yes. Yeah, I think we won uh, one of the last nine, but uh, you know Gee. we we did enough yeah. uh, early on points wise to scrape mm. in the eight, and right. unfortunately we went up to Brizzy and um, That's right. wasn't to be. A few yeah. dodgy calls, but yeah, always is when you lose. Yeah, um, yeah. But, there were uh, a few tough calls. Around yeah, that. Uh, wasn't uh, wasn't the way we wanted to finish, but uh, you know I'm very happy with you know, how my career uh, panned out, and uh, you know I certainly have no regrets. Oh, mate, absolutely. You know, um, you had a tremendous career. And like I said, when you consider, you know, the blokes that you were playing with, I guess at the beginning of um, when you started playing at the elite level in senior football with the Toowoomba Clydesdales, you know, you pretty much outlasted a lot of them. So, um, yeah, no, sensational, mate. Now, speaking of that, with a physical sport like rugby league, it is often said players do go around for one too many a season. However, your fitness and always impeccable condition had you looking like you could have laced up the boots for at least another season or two. What actually prompted your retirement at the end of 2016, Nathan? Yeah, as I said, I, you know, leading into 2016, I was pretty comfortable uh, physically where I was and you know, I still loved the sport. Yeah. You know, it had given me so much over 15 years and... Um, it wasn't until probably round three or four that I took a decent knock and something that I probably would have brushed yeah. and uh, brushed right. off early on in my career and um, you know I had to start to reevaluate life um, mm. and think you know we're two beautiful boys and 
and lovely yeah. wife and you know, there's plenty of life post footy and yeah. uh, I just come home actually uh, after that game and I, you know, I didn't come off the field or anything but yeah. you know, it was enough to, to rock me and yeah. um, played on and said to the wife that yeah, maybe it's time that you know, at the end of the season I yeah, reevaluate and maybe you know, hang out the boots and yeah, you know, no one ever wants to say that, but you know, yeah. like I said, I've, I've been very fortunate. Obviously, haven't played for Australia or Queensland, but uh, you know, I had a handy guy in front of me, and yeah. you know, I was very happy with you know, you know, what I was able to achieve uh, over my career, and certainly had yeah, nothing to look back, no regrets. Oh, mate, you had a career that, you know, all of us young fellas who start out playing, you know, mini and, mini and mod footy would just absolutely envy, you know. So, um, yeah, no, absolutely, mate. And, um, no, well, well, thanks for sharing that, mate. Um, and, you know, we do see a lot of footballers struggle once their footy career ends. Um, they often speak of a lack of direction or motivation in their lives, but you're such a self-motivated bloke and a man of many talents. Um, can you share with us some of the things that you've been involved in since your retirement from footy in, in 2016 and what you enjoy doing these days post NRL career? Mate, I've, I've done many things during the day. Um, at yeah. night time I take care of the farmers and my father-in-law's got a couple of Toyota dealerships so right. I take care of O'Brien Toyota uh, yeah. out west so if anyone needs a, yeah. a Toyota, cruiser, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, Give Neil a call. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I take care of his insurance and, and finance right. and take care of those guys at night time. Yeah. Look after the farmers and they're great to work with. But um, during the day, or, you know, nutrition has been something that I've certainly leaned upon throughout mm. my career and realised, mm. you know, if, if it's not down pat, then, you know, mm. your performance really wavers. Um, so yeah, in the health space, I love it. Listen to podcasts, read books, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and... Obviously, been a bricky by trade. I've I've moved in and I've done renovations for people, friends. Yeah. Uh, some maintenance stuff for metric on homes. Uh, yeah. A bit of everything. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Kind of. My wife is uh, turning into full time study to to be a teacher as of right. March this year. So. Wow. Um, yeah. I need to place up the boots again and uh, <laughs> do something full time during the day as well as the the finance and insurance, just so she can. Yeah, get through it and yeah. you know, finish up early and yeah. three years' time, maybe yeah. get a job overseas and do a bit yeah. of travel. Yeah, oh, mate, that sounds like a plan, but um, I know, you know, um, knowing you, you know, obviously, um, you know, here on the Gold Coast and having the fortune of teaching um, young lads, um, wonderful boys, wonderful family, you know, you've got so much to offer, so I'm sure in, you know, any one of those many vast um, areas that you've talked about, you've got a diverse number of interests and, and abilities um, definitely you'll pick up something so um, yeah absolutely mate um, got so much to contribute so that's brilliant well um, with yourself being such a diversely talented bloke and, and all of us who know you know you as a dedicated father and a sensational family man have you thought of being a mentor for young NRL players as we see them often struggle with the balance between footy and personal life you know I think you'd be the ideal person to provide that um, as the NRL looked into that type of initiative because that would be a sensational role for someone like yourself. Yeah, I think the NRL, uh, obviously they've got welfare um, coaches or welfare people at, at clubs um, that try help with the transition. Yeah, right. Um, and look for, for the uh, younger guys and sit down with them and, and see where they want to head and sure. you know, provide them, take courses, uh, university degrees if, if required. And the NRL obviously fund that. Mm, yeah. uh, which is which is a great initiative. Yeah. But um, yeah, transition wise, uh, um, I think the NRL run a program called uh, what is it? Uh, I think it's um, Footy to to work or something like that. Okay. So they do yeah. have a program. But, yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. It'd be it'd be great to be a part of something like that, especially locally at yeah. the coast. Yeah. Um, work with you know, probably the 17, 18 year olds that, mm -hmm. you know, are striving on one hand to be mm. an athlete, but uh, if it doesn't work out, then they've mm. also got a, a career yeah. ahead of them for, for a long period of time, you know, I was right. very fortunate yeah. that, uh, you know, I had my bricklaying uh, apprenticeship sorted before I actually started uh, first yes. grade, you know, so I was 21 when I made my first grade debut, so mm. times have certainly changed and, and the kids go straight out of high school as I've spoken about, and they, they cruise straight into to first grade and full-time 
and they probably mm. aren't given that uh, you know three or four years to find their feet and yeah. um, you know mm. implement something like a you know a trade or, or uni degree. So yeah. Although it may be a little bit later in life, but uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I think the NRL are doing a great job with the transition stuff, and I'd, yeah, I'd certainly love to mm. to assist if I could. Yeah, oh mate, you'd be ideal for that role for sure. Well, now we've come to Dan Mars guys, Furious Five, where I ask you, Nathan Friend, five questions on the run. All right, here we go, mate. Who was the best player you ever played against? Yeah, so it's over my career, I've played with a lot of. Very talented people. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I've still got Cam Smith running around. He's a set legend. <laughs> um, Greg Inglis, as shown by the uh, 05 mm. uh, Q Cup. Yeah, <laughs> we're just looking at that. Yeah. <laughs> Q Some Cup program. Man. He was fullback, mate. And yeah, yeah. And he wasn't a game go boy that he didn't probably score three and kick five. He was a, yeah, he was a goal kicker and... as well. So oh, nothing shit. he couldn't do. But you know, the hardest guy to play against was. You know, as many that uh, I couldn't tackle, they were too hard to tackle, but uh, I, yeah, just because of the size and Petro Simonsi would turn into tackles, you'd hit his hip every time, you know. Mm. Yeah. Being a low tackler, mate, it didn't help. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, I did say Darren Lockyer. Yeah, what okay. about another? Just because yeah. I was a, uh, I was an 80-minute player, and yeah, yeah, my ultimate was to put pressure on the fifth tackle, mm. uh, yeah. whatever the kicker may be, and. Yeah. Uh, Lockie, mate, he was, you know, he was left footer, so I'd always go to his right <laughs> trying to stop him. And yeah. Mate, he bamboozled me every time. He'd step yeah. that way and he'd put it on his right <laughs> foot. And yeah. yeah. There's no way to stop the guy, otherwise he yeah. would run it. If, you know, if I'd come out of the line, he'd run it. Yeah. And, you know, he'd probably set up a try and yeah. I'd look like a fool once again. Mate, I hear you. I hear you. But, um, oh, mate, I don't think there were too many people that you missed in your tackles. Like, you were pretty much at the top of the tackle count most games, so. Definitely um, nothing to, it, to yeah, be ashamed of there, that's for sure. You're a great defender. All right, so who was your greatest influence in your career, Nathan? Um, well, if we look at uh, athletes, um, I'd say Alfie was my, oh, yeah. my, uh, my idol when yeah. I was growing up because he was short in stature like myself, uh, yeah. a little guy. But obviously my, my parents are you know, the go-to when it comes to that. and. Mm. The old man was always coaching, assisting, um, yeah. and I used to just run around the field and be a part. I thought I was a part of the big boys, you know, whenever he used to coach, and I'd be chasing, yeah. chasing, running around the field. And, you know, I, I dare say a lot of my skill base and skill set was set early on, mm. and that was just being around Dad and, mm. you know, listening to him coach all the guys and how they, you know, looked up to him, and he was like a father figure to them, and yeah. he's certainly my best mate. Yeah. And, uh, you That's know, he awesome. was. It was great, you know, I was the only boy in the family and yeah. um, I had two sisters which allowed me to play volleyball, yeah. um, softball, all yeah. the girly sports, but I think yeah. um, those skills uh, transpired across into rugby Absolutely. league and they certainly assisted instead of just playing the one sport. Mm. And, mm. Um, yeah, I'd have to say Dad was a big influence. Um, yeah. He loved his footy and obviously uh, we loved each other and yeah, know, yeah. he certainly took me anywhere I wanted to go. Yeah. Um, and money was no issue when it came to yeah. tours and you know I was one that didn't make representative teams early on so it was okay yeah I was happy with that I'd go pick yeah. him with that on weekends and yeah. you know just do the man thing and the boy thing and yeah um, yeah it just so happens that you know I had the opportunity later in life once again and um, yeah so I got the best of both worlds and you know obviously dad was always there to support me whatever yeah. I wanted to do yeah oh brilliant mate um, so, who was your fiercest rival opponent when you were playing, would you say? Um, yeah, I've had a few, obviously, being yeah. a hooker. Yeah. Um, always loved coming up against uh, Cam Smith. Yeah. Being, being the best in the game. And yeah. You always pride yourself on, you know, making mm. a good account for yourself. And, yeah. Uh, anyone I've played against, any of the teams I've played for, uh, yeah. you know, whenever i played against them, I always seem to... Yeah. You know, really focus in that week and mm -hmm. you know, hope to get one over the old boys. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I dare say my battles with uh, Robbie yeah. Farrer yeah. Uh, over my time. Uh, right. Yeah, it was certainly up there. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we did have a little bit of niggle. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I never said anything uh, during <laughs> games that 
yeah. you know, I wasn't one for the for the cheek. I probably wasn't smart enough or quick witted no. enough to do it. Um, I kind of just uh, you were put a lot of pressure on people. Yeah, <laughs> you're a lot of pressure on kickers, and mm -hmm. Robbie was obviously a kicker, and That's yeah, right. he didn't take much liking to. Yeah. Certainly, they were never late. The tackles and yeah, yeah the yeah. pressure I put on him. Was, yeah. Yeah, got under his collar a few times, and yeah, yeah we did um, come to blows occasionally. Yeah, I'm just remembering there was uh, a game at Leichhardt Oval, wasn't there? Was it 2007 or 2008? Did you guys had a little set too? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it was in a scrum. Yeah. I mean, I had, I had headgear on yeah. there because I headbutted him, so yeah, I'm not quite sure how, how that works or yeah. how soft he must have been. But yeah, <laughs> that's it, that's it. Perfect. Yeah, uh, good on you, mate. Well, you know, if there was one piece of advice you could give to an NRL rookie today, what would it be? Um, I guess uh, skill can only get you so far. Yeah. Um, you know, I may give you the opportunity. I may give you the opportunity to um, present yourself at, at clubs that you may not have a, the opportunity to do. But mm. I mean, yeah. you need the hard work that comes along with it. You know, so many guys yeah. get to a certain point in their career, and um, as I said, talent's got them to there. But yeah. you know, as an overall athlete. Yeah, uh, you need both drive, dedication, and the skill. Mm. And um, mm. if I could say, you know, one thing to, to keep a level headed. Yeah. Keep very level head. Yeah. And um, don't get ahead of yourself. Be very humble. Mm. Um, train hard. Um, yeah. Write down your goal, whatever yeah. it may be, and work back from there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And yeah, mind your p's and q's and. Yeah. Yeah, just just little things I guess. Yeah. You know, they're the things that you don't see. But yeah. um right. if you look at Melbourne and places like mm. that I've been at are very successful. Yeah. You know, culture is what they do that it's yeah. not seen. You know, it's to turn out the training an hour early. Right. Yeah. You know, just yeah. putting glasses away in the in yeah. the kitchen and yeah, you know, cleaning after yourself and yeah. all that respectful stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So Yeah. Yeah. No, that's tremendous, mate. Well, you were, you were a living example of that and still are, mate. Yeah, that's tremendous. So, speaking of, like, preparation, what was your pre-game meal? Did you have one throughout your whole career or did it kind of vary? Mate, I, um, I honed it in. Um, yeah? Probably midway through my career, I was always three hours pre-game. Yeah, right. So, if it was, uh... A seven o'clock game at night time. Yeah. Um, it'd be four o'clock to be my last meal. Right, right. And uh, I wasn't on top of my nutrition <laughs> as much as I am now, but it was, okay. it was usually a sandwich. Sandwich. Yeah. yeah. Um, would have a bit of you know, salad and yeah. ham on it. Okay. Or, yeah. Yeah, and then I'd work back to lunch. Yeah. And then lunch would be uh, ham and a bit of strawberry jam. Yeah. <laughs> Being a yeah, you know, a kickback yeah. from the German days, my yeah. old man. And, uh, right. yeah, brekkie would probably be eggs on toast. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, a bit of bacon and eggs. Getting that protein in. Yeah, so yeah. I, I used to eat a fair bit during the, during the day, especially mm. game day. Mm. Right, uh, right. A lot of guys I played with, played with were uh, very light on, and mm. um, they yeah. would uh, maybe have one meal. Some would, oh, you know, just drink yeah. fluids all day. Um, yeah, right. you know, I was fortunate that I could, you know, take in and consume a lot of food. Yeah. Um, but that's why I would stop three hours before a game because mm. I didn't want to feel heavy. Mm. Come the game, and you know, I used to sit on the toilet two or three times a day. And yeah. On yeah. game day, and right. you now my nerves obviously passed uh, yeah. what I had in my stomach anyway. Right. And uh, yeah. now before the game, I'd have a protein shake. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But obviously right. the back end of my career and yeah. I didn't worry about the protein shake. I was sure. my stores were full and I was ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Oh well mate, it, it's obvious to see how nutrition's, you know, been a natural progression for you then. Um, you know, being an elite athlete yourself, so alright, well thanks for surviving Dan Mask Guys Furious Five, mate. And Friendy, we salute you, mate, here at More Than a Game. You've enjoyed an amazing rugby league career. And you're always the people's champ, a man of small stature that the average punter could cheer for, and I've been privileged to know you as the great bloke and family man you are off the field also, mate. Thank you, Nathan Frank. Thanks, buddy.
Ten minutes later, Nathan Friend darted over as the home side assumed control. Friend goes straight through and for the second time inside their own 20, the Cowboys crack alarmingly.